How did the New Orleans Saints and tight end Foster Moreau go from cancer diagnosis to contract? We got all of that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdat Nation and Houdat family? Welcome in to another episode of Locked On Saints, your daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Saints, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks so much as always, making Locked On Saints your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget, you can subscribe and follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And as always, I am your host, Ross Jackson, at Ross Jackson Nola on Twitter, your New Orleans Saints expert. Credential member of the media, you can find me over at Sports Illustrated's Fan Nation site covering the New Orleans Saints Saints News Network as their senior writer and reporter. You can also find me Tuesdays over on Locked on NFL and here with you every single Monday through Friday on the Locked on Saints podcast. And on today's episode of Locked on Saints, I was out at the Chateau Country Club on Monday getting some interviews with Cam Jordan, Dennis Allen, Mickey Loomis, and others from the New Orleans Saints organization. So we're going to be going over some of the information that we got from those guys. We're going to take a look at uh, Cam Jordan and how ready he is to have those rookies in the room with him. Dennis Allen spoke on the rookie class as well, but also his expectation for the attendance at OTAs. But first, I want to take a look at how the New Orleans Saints landed Foster Moreau, how they went from cancer diagnosis to contract deal. And it's a really incredible story, actually. And this is going to take us to a couple of different places here. The first place that I want to stop off at is kind of Adam Schefter's podcast. Adam Schefter interviewed Foster Moreau and the episode released on a Monday. And in the interview, they spoke about all of the things that kind of transpired between the cancer diagnosis and the agreement being reached with the New Orleans Saints. In case you've forgotten or in case you've missed it, just to quickly recap, back in May, uh, back in March, rather, former Las Vegas Raiders tight end Foster Moreau and good friend of Derek Carr's came to New Orleans to get a physical done and do a free agency visit. During that physical, the Saints uncovered a diagnosis of Hodgkin's lymphoma. It's a form of cancer. And so he then had began to undergo treatments and things like this. Um, he had basically all but said that he was going to be stepping away from the game of football in 2023, but didn't ever close the door on you know playing again. Come April, he's all of a sudden finishing up his physical. Come May, he's signed and he's a New Orleans Saint. And we all expect to see him out on the field next Tuesday when media shows up for OTAs. So this is a huge leap for what we expected Foster Moreau to be going through over the course of the offseason to where he actually ended up. Talk about how it started and how it's going type of a situation. So here's the update on kind of how things happen. Basically, Foster Moreau's cancer is the type that could be treated with medication as opposed to chemotherapy and radiation. So as he explained to Adam Schefter, he's not undergoing either of those two. Instead, he's doing a much less taxing form which is basically just a medication that pinpoints the specific type of cancer that he has. Reportedly, or not even reportedly, right? This is straight from the horse's mouth. The way that he explains it is as follows. My schedule was looking like this. I finished, and he's talking about his treatments, on Tuesday, signed my contract on Wednesday, and then Thursday, I was out running routes with my quarterback, my wide receivers, and my running backs at the Saints practice facility at 7.30 in the morning. So two big takeaways there. First of all, Wow. Um, <laughs> to go to get to that so quickly, to not only being done with the treatments, to not only signing the contract, but to being out on the field and running routes and having the power, being in football shape enough to be able to do that. He mentioned that that was the biggest challenge because the medication wasn't as taxing as maybe some of the other treatments out there, like the alternative of chemotherapy and radiation as we think about cancer treatments. That this was a situation to where Really, the biggest hurdle for him, he said, was the mental side of it, getting back in a football shape, which clearly he's done a good job of, as we expect to see him out on the field at OTAs, and he was out there running routes already and working with the quarterbacks, receivers, and running backs uh, just a few days ago. And the other, my second highlight or my second takeaway from that is that the quarterback, wide receivers, and running backs were all out there getting some work in at 7.30 in the morning, Friday or Thursday just last week. Really, really good sign there as well, because remember, the Saints started rookie minicamps on Friday. So if he's out there with his quarterback, which I take to mean Derek Carr, considering how close the two are, 
the day before rookie minis being out there throwing passes and running routes and running backs working out and wide receivers working out and all that, there's a good expectation that some of those players will be available and present when it comes to OTAs. We'll discuss that a little bit later and why that's important, as well as Dennis Allen's expectation there. The next thing that I just quickly want to highlight is that he mentioned that there were a few other teams that were interested. We reported this thanks to Brooke Kirchhoff over at WWL TV and New Orleans South Football that the Saints had an offer on the table, but that other teams are interested as well. He named a few of those teams. A return to the Raiders was apparently a possibility. Mike McDaniels and the uh, Miami Dolphins were a possibility. And then, of course, Jordan Love and the Green Bay Packers were also a possibility. Those are three teams that he mentioned that were interested in him. He did also have a visit with the Cincinnati Bengals before he came back here to New Orleans. But here's one of the things that I absolutely loved when you heard from uh, Foster Moreau in this interview was a story of how everything came together. Foster Moreau effectively explained that he got that diagnosis and basically, let's see, that Saturday was the physical, that Sunday, so the day after, Mickey Loomis calls his agent, Joe Linta, and says, quote, look, we still value Foster as a person. We value him even more as a player. We would absolutely love to sign him to whatever deal we can, whatever you guys feel comfortable, and whenever he's ready to play, we're excited to have him regardless. We're going to keep him here. We're going to keep him at home. And Foster Moreau said that spoke volumes. So while he doesn't necessarily confirm that the reason or that his decision to sign with the Saints was directly attached to them being the ones to find out his diagnosis, it's clear that the way that they treated him immediately after he received that diagnosis moved the needle big time for him because they basically said, look, We want him here in the building. We want him to stay home. We want to keep him home. So whatever y'all want, we'll make it happen. And they get a three-year, $12 million deal that's perfectly structured for the team in order to get it all done. One more thing to dive into here. I just want you to hear a little bit of um, Mickey Loomis, Saints General Manager's thoughts on the signing of Foster Moreau, the logic behind it, and a little more detail here. This is Mickey Loomis from the uh, Chateau Country Club yesterday morning. Well, first of all, you know, we brought him in because he's a good player and, and um, you know, a versatile, well-rounded tight end. The fact that he's from New Orleans and, and has a history, you know, at LSU and here really had nothing to do with our interest in him. Um, and, you know, that, that was, uh, um, and that's emotional. You know, to, to come take a physical and, and discover something that is unexpected. I know that's tough on him and his family, and yet they, they handle it so beautifully. And, and uh, you know, the great news is, is that the prognosis is good, and, and even the treatment uh, protocol that he's going to be under is going to allow him to, you know, do some things in this, uh, in this off season and hopefully play. Uh, in the fall. So uh, one of the things that Mickey highlighting there is that the fact that he's from New Orleans, the fact that he's LSU was kind of less important than the fact that that's just simply a player, the mold that they really liked and that they really wanted. And so they were able to get that contract done. So again, um, you could see the respect and the relationship between the organization and the player and the player in the organization. He said that Foster Moreau basically said he's been a Saints fan ever since the Aaron Brooks days and all that, which like if you were a Saints fan throughout the Aaron Brooks days and before, and you're still a Saints fan now, like you've been put through pr- a pretty big ringer during <laughs> during that time. And so Foster Moreau being able to come back, work with his former quarterback and mentor, a guy that he respects a lot in Derek Carr, uh, and to be able to do that in a New Orleans Saints uniform, which of course, as he mentioned, was his childhood team coming up. So really, really just fantastic story that just seemingly has no caveats, which is so unusual for the NFL, but one that we get to enjoy here big time. Um, as New Orleans Saints fans, as New Orleans Saints media, and here in the city of New Orleans. So excited to see Foster Moreau out on the field next week. Um, OTAs, media will be present literally a day from uh, a week from today. So very much looking forward to all of that. What are the expectations, though, in terms of attendance during those OTAs? Well, Dennis Allen gave us a little bit of an update on that, as well as his evaluation of rookies after rookie minicamps. Got that coming up for you as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the number one sportsbook in all of America, and they have everything that you can ever imagine over on their site. Boxing, golf, hockey. Uh, You can get in on some of the MLB action going on all around right now. There's auto racing. 
There's even some future stuff you can get in on when it comes to uh, the NFL as well, including week one odds. The Saints favorite at home, three and a half points, which effectively is like home field advantage plus a half point. So they're effectively half point favorites uh, in this game up against the Tennessee Titans. Tajay Spears is going to be making his return to New Orleans. Derrick Henry is going to be nice and fresh. We'll see what happens with the Tennessee Titans uh, quarterback situation. But the Saints reloaded offense and their very talented defense look to be up to the task and hope to open up the 2023 season in a way that they haven't opened up season since 2013, which is the last time that they went 2-0. So if you feel confident about their opportunity to go 1-0 to start the season, FanDuel.com slash locked on is for you. And if you've never placed a bet before, you're going to be able to get a no sweat first bet of up to $100, or excuse me, actually up to $1,000. That's up to $1,000 in bonus bets you can get back if your first bet doesn't win. So go and check them out today. FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, family, continuing on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. Appreciate all you everydayers out there for making us your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget, we'll be live tonight over on the Locked on Saints YouTube page. And of course, the audio and video will be posted for everybody afterwards as well. We're going to be breaking down Nick Anderson, former two-lane linebacker, now a New Orleans Saints undrafted free agent with a real chance to potentially steal a roster spot at a spot where the Saints could use some help at linebacker. So we'll be breaking that down in tonight's episode of Locked on Saints, as well as getting to some more of your questions and everything in our midweek uh, fundamentals episode tomorrow morning as well. Back to the two-a-days here every Monday through Thursday, and then, of course, your Friday episode every morning. All right, so let's continue on with today's episode, though. Looking at Dennis Allen's comments from the Chateau Country Club, the New Orleans Saints Hall of Fame Golf Classic. Uh, the thing that I want to start with here is OTAs. OTAs start in a week. So what's the expectation in terms of attendance? We've seen more and more across the NFL that fewer and fewer people have been attending OTAs, right? We've seen it um, be that teams completely sit out OTAs. We've seen it that teams or you know veteran players don't attend OTAs, all of that. But the Saints are now in a situation where you've got, you know, a new quarterback. You've got a lot of new pieces on the offense, including on the offensive line. You've got a ton of new pieces on the defense, especially the defensive line. And you have new coaches on the defensive side as well. So early attendance and early participation in OTA is almost critical to your success so that you're not effectively going into training camp and having to calibrate. You want to get all the calibration stuff, all the shorthand, all of the language stuff out of the way so that when you get to training camp, you can just work and start your installs and doing all the things you have to get done during training camp. So having a, uh, you know, a, a large presence or a large contingent show up for your OTAs becomes pretty important. So you've got three sessions of OTAs effectively each of the next three weeks, uh, starting on Tuesday each week. We'll be out there every Tuesday throughout. Um, and so we'll be able to provide, provide updates during that time. But I think the biggest thing that you're looking for here is who's going to be present. And Dennis Allen gave a little bit of an update there and said that they don't expect 100%, but they expect a pretty good amount of players to be there. And he seemed to be actually pretty coy about his expectation, but it kind of makes you feel like, oh, okay, there is going to be a pretty large contingent of players that are going to be out there. And I think as evidenced by the Foster Moreau comments and the things that we know about Foster Moreau, I was told that Foster Moreau was going to be out on the field. And I told you, know, we mentioned this the day that he was signed in our show, in our reaction show, that basically what I was told is that he's going to be, that we should expect him out on the field next week. And so that would mean OTAs. Now, what that means in terms of his participation level and things like that, we'll see, right? It could be that he's out on the field, but that he's not full go during that time, which would make perfect sense. But for the Saints, having Foster Moreau out there, knowing that Foster Moreau was out there with, we assume Derek Carr, when he says my quarterback, that's what makes the most sense. And his Adam Schefter interview. And so Derek Carr and these wide receivers and running backs were all out there getting worked in at 7, 730 in the morning on the Thursday that he signed or the day after he signed that, OK, you could then conceivably expect and I think reasonably expect that you're going to see a large portion of those players, including Derek Carr at OTAs. And I do think that that's important. I, I think in previous years, I've been an advocate for the idea of look, OTAs, if they're, you know, if something's voluntary as an NFL player. If you don't want to show up, I get it, right? You can get hurt. You could lose money. You could lose your contract. You could lose money off of that contract because of injuries, things like that. I completely understand. I completely get it. However, in a situation like this for the New Orleans Saints, where you have so much new at so many important spots, literally the most important position on the field for you is new at quarterback uh, in Derek Carr. 
And so I, I get the idea here instead that, yeah, everyone wants to be present or as many people as possible want to be present. So I wouldn't be surprised to see. We know that Cam Jordan's going to be present. He basically told us that during his time at the country club on Monday, uh, saying that, you know, and, and Cam's always been at OTAs. That, that's never really changed for him. So we'll see if some of the other veteran guys show up, but it sounds like a pretty large contingent of players is going to be there. And that's good news for the New Orleans Saints. In fact, it might even be critical to their success in 2023. Up next up, I want to take a look, though, at mini camps because mini camps just finished up. We talked to you about standouts. We talked to you about all the different notes, people that stood out, coaches that stood out, all of that. But here's what Dennis Allen had to say while at the country club yesterday about how what he saw at training camp sort of backed up or excuse me, at rookie mini camps sort of backed up the decisions that they had already made when it came to their rookie draft class and undrafted free agents as well. Yeah, look, I think so. It, you know, obviously it was, it was um, you know, kind of our initial look at these guys once they kind of got into the building. But um, I, I like I like the draft picks. I like the unsigned free agents or, or, or the signed college free agents. Um, I'm excited about, you know, kind of really next week getting started with with, uh, with some football practice and, you know, see what type, what type of team we're going to have. But I feel good about where we're at and, and excited about getting to work. So Dennis Allen, clearly very excited about the, the draft class that he got there, as well as, of course, the undrafted free agents. And there's a lot of, uh, there, there's, I think it's fair to say, a lot of confidence in what this class can be for the New Orleans Saints. And I think there's a lot of kind of, People being kind of hush hush about you know what the expectation is and everything, but I can tell you that there's a lot of expectation that this could be kind of a cornerstone draft class for the New Orleans Saints. I don't want to compare it to 2017 because 2017 was such a successful draft class, like a historically successful draft class. Five of the seven players that the Saints drafted, if you put all of their contracts together, are making nearly 400 million dollars uh, combined. That's nearly twice today's salary cap, for instance, and you know, you saw those guys go, you know, offensive rookie, offensive rookie, defensive rookie of the year, all that. It, you can't compare any class to the 2017 class. But you think back to maybe the 2006 class, you think back to some of the stronger classes here recently, or really not even that. Think about some of the weaker classes here recently, like the 2020 draft class. We haven't gotten around to looking at 2021, 2022 in hindsight yet. We looked at 2022 so far, uh, but we didn't, we haven't gotten to 2021 or 2020. In 2020, like, spoiler alert, it, it's not a great class. It's not a good class. I mean, you've got guys that are in that class that aren't on the team any longer. Adam Trotman traded away, Tommy Stevens, whatever happened with him. Um, and then you've got Zach Mon, who's turned into, you know, a great, you know, backup linebacker for you and a great special teams asset. But maybe that's a little bit under what you expected for a third round selection. And then you have a guy like Cesar Ruiz, who's kind of up and down and, you know, is coming off the Liz Frank injury, had a great season last year. Now, can he follow it up? He's your biggest question mark. But if the Saints can get one starter out of that four-person class and they're batting 25%, that's pretty dang good, honestly. But is it 2017? Is it 2006? No. Is it 2022? No. 2022, 2023, both of those have real opportunities to be cornerstone draft classes for this organization. And I think that there's a little bit of that that you got to see during rookie mini camps, if you're a coach and you got to see all of it. Those of us in media, we saw one hour, a good portion of it was them stretching and us counting jersey numbers and making sure that everybody was there and seeing who was there, who wasn't there. That's how we noticed that Central Michigan tight end Joel Wilson wasn't there. And then John Hendricks breaking the news there that he had failed his physical and therefore wasn't signed to the team. But then after that, we watched some individual drills, some routes on air, some throws against nothing, all of that stuff. But if you're the coaches, you got to see a lot more than that, right? And so it's very clear that there's some excitement around this draft class for the New Orleans Saints. I feel the excitement around it. I'm sure you feel the excitement around it. But more importantly, perhaps more importantly, or just as importantly, the organization feels a lot of excitement around that draft class as well. And that's not limited to just coaches and general managers. It's other players as well. Cam Jordan excited about the two new rookies joining his defensive line. We'll get more from him on that as well as should you expect Cam Jordan to sign a new contract anytime soon? We got a little bit of insight on that as well. Got that coming up for you as we continue on to wrap up today's episode of Locked On Saints, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it, Huda Nation. Wrapping up today's episode of Locked On Saints with a quick look at our conversation with Cam Jordan and why he's so excited to have this sort of revamped defensive line all around him. I mean, Cam Jordan is the only returning starter on the defensive line, with the exception of maybe you give a little bit of an edge there. 
to Carl Granderson as well, who stole some starts toward the end of the season. It was literally at a point where he was stealing starts from Marcus Davenport, which is why it was no surprise when Marcus Davenport didn't make his return to New Orleans. He's now a Minnesota Viking. And so when you look at where Kim Jordan kind of sits here, he's a 12, 13 year NFL veteran. He is uh, the only returning starter on the defensive line. David Onyemata has gone. Shai Tuttle has gone. Marcus Davenport has gone. And now he's got a lot of new and exciting guys that are around him. Colin Saunders, who is a sort of sneakily athletic, big defensive tackle, kind of built a little bit more like a nose tackle, but has good feet, can get around and can penetrate as well as a pass rusher. You've got a guy like Nathan Shepard who had a top 10 pass rush win rate in 2022, extremely disruptive, young, athletic, very, very athletic defensive tackle, pretty similar actually to the mold of David Onyemata. Then you look over on the edge, you don't have Marcus Davenport anymore, but you've still got Tano Passanio who can you know move from outside to inside. He's got that positional versatility. Peyton Turner is still in the building. We'll see if he's able to stay out on the field and be healthy. One of the things that Cam Jordan mentioned about Peyton Turner is that, look, he had a two-sack game you know, last year, had a two-sack game a couple of years ago, uh, only played in, what, like four games last season, only appeared in like a handful of games last year. And so you can see that it's there, and when it clicks, he shows you the impact player that he can be. The issue is that he can't stay on the field. And Cam Jordan highlighting that, Jeff Ireland highlighted that during the Senior Bowl, Dennis Allen has mentioned that, that that's kind of the biggest concern when it comes to Peyton Turner is just literally his ability to stay out on the field because when he's there and the opportunities are there, he tends to be pretty dang impactful. So there's a lot of good stuff going on for the state's defensive line, but with the new faces arriving, there's always sort of the question marks. How will these guys fit? How will they mold? How will they mesh? All of that, but it's safe to say that Cam Jordan uh, is not going to make this any tougher than it needs to be on guys like Brian Brzee and Isaiah Foskey. He's clearly very excited to have the young guys added to the defensive line. He's young. He's talented. You look at some of his college tape, you see the explosiveness. You know, we, we love we love potential, don't we? So as long as we can we can help mold and help him live up to that, I think we've got a great D tackle with the future. Uh, we then went dip jack into the second round and picked up a defensive end. We love our defensive ends. They, we don't go more than two years without drafting them. Um, and I love that idea that you can never have enough D in depth. Uh, with with big Fa- was it Fowski Fowski met him yesterday met, met him yesterday um, you know talked to my OG Justin Tuck and he sort of connected us right after uh, young, young Buck got drafted these Notre Dame guys we've had some good ones Manti Teo was a great guy so I know he's gonna be a phenomenal uh, presence in the locker room just just being off of that he's now, excited to meet you yeah I mean I met him yesterday kid 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 is ready to uh, learn I can't call him kid he's grown right over eighteen yeah he's grown ish. Um, but I, I love that I have two, uh, two rookie D linemen in, in the locker room for sure. So you can hear a couple of different voices in there along with the bird. Sorry about the bird. Not a lot that we could do about that with it being outdoors, but Mike Triplett, um, Kat Terrell over at ESPN, of course, uh, Taryn Walk of, uh, NOLA.com and myself. So we're all sitting there kind of having this conversation with him. And you look, the, the Saints defense has already gone out on a, a, a NOLA, NOLA, uh, motorsports go, go kart. Uh, thing. Demario Davis took them all to Dave and Buster's over on Porges. Like they're doing all the things to kind of bond and be together and all that. And and Isaiah Foskey, when he was asked, like, who is the guy that you're most the person you're most excited to meet when you get to the Saints facility? And the first person he mentioned was was Cam Jordan. And so you can already see the camaraderie start to build. And while that's not necessarily guaranteed to translate to anything on the field, which actually one of the things that I really respected from Cam Jordan during his his conversation with us was sort of his awareness of that, is that like sometimes things sound really good on paper, but still have to get them to work out on the field. And so he kind of highlighted that when he was talking about Todd Grantham and the defensive line coach, new Saints, new defensive line coach that's coming in. And also just a, a really nice awareness from Cam Jordan around the situation that the team is in, the changing of the guard over on the defensive line, almost in its entirety, the changes that are, you know, at head coach or not at head coach, but that are positioning that are at the position coach and then sort of the shifts that are going on there and how things might look great on paper, but the work still has to be done in order for things to translate out onto the field. So really good stuff there from Cam. Of course, he opened that conversation talking about Brian Brzee and his athleticism and everything and then and then transitioned over to uh, Isaiah Foskey and the impact that he brings. But if Isaiah Foskey turns in five or six sacks his rookie season, Bearing in mind that Kim Jordan had won his rookie season, um, he's off to a lightning fast start in this New Orleans Saints defense and in this organization and opposite Cam Jordan, right? And Cam Jordan 
doesn't look at it as a changing the guard just yet in terms of him passing a torch over to Isaiah Foskey. He actually spoke to us a little bit more about his contract and um, what it is that that it would effectively mean. And, you know, it, it's one of those things to where Cam Jordan very clearly feels like he still has a number of years left in him. And while he's not necessarily, you know, the one negotiating his contract or anything like that, he's getting communication from his representation who's saying, hey, um, here's what we're talking about. And Cam Jordan effectively will be like, all right, cool, keep talking uh, or we're good. And so there's a chance that there's another contract extension for Cam Jordan on the way. And I don't want to get into numbers of what that that looks like. If you're part of the subtext group, you might have that information. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, if you want to join that, you can find the link in the description. Uh, but when it comes down to, you know, where it is for him, he's, he's feels like he's got a couple of years left. And it's clear that just like we spoke about maybe what, about a month ago, a couple of weeks ago, he still wants to be a lifer. He wants to finish his contract uh, here in New Orleans. Um, and so I, I think, you know, one of the things that he did mention is that if they traded him, he would be mad. Um, and he was talking about kind of Akeem Hicks and that Akeem Hicks is angry at everybody. Uh, you know, he's growling all over the place and all the other weird stuff that he does on the field. But, you know, he was angry at Drew Brees. He was angry at the New Orleans Saints organization. And basically what he said was like, yeah, like if they ever traded me away, I'd be pretty angry too. So as long as the New Orleans Saints don't trade him away, <laughs> they should be in a good spot here to be able to help him uh, do what it is that he's always wanted to do. And the first bit was, um, get that, you know, all time sack record, which he now owns. Uh, the second bit was win a Super Bowl. There's still a lot of time and opportunity for that. And then the third bit was to finish his career as a New Orleans Saint and be a lifer. And he's uh, yet another year closer uh, to that. So, um, you know, he's going to be a guy that's fighting for 90, 95% of snaps out on the field. And basically, the way that he explained it was that as long as he feels like he's still out there ready to fight for snaps, he plans to stay in an NFL uniform. And hopefully um, that NFL uniform is black and gold and brandish with a floor delete. All right, coming up later on today, y'all, we're uh, over at the Lots on Saints YouTube page, probably around 6.30 Eastern, or excuse me, 6.30 Central time. I don't know why I always do that. I do that every time. 6.30 Central time. Uh, we're going to be live over in the Locked on Saints YouTube page uh, talking Tulane uh, linebacker Nick Anderson and what his potential uh, kind of pathway to the roster might be. And just kind of exploring that linebacker position a little bit more as well as it seems to be the one of the last remaining places the Saints really should put some focus. And we'll see what are some of the ways that they can uh, get that done. So we got that coming up for you later on today. And of course, that'll be available um, on every you know podcast platform and everything as well. So don't worry if you're not able to catch it live. It'll be there for you very, very soon after. Appreciate all the everydayers out there for being with us for another episode of Locked on Saints, making me a part of your day, part of your routine for saying yes to me and the show. As always, if you see me, say hi. If you need anything else around your New Orleans Saints in between these episodes, make sure you follow me on Twitter at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how you're mom and them. And trust you, that nation. I'll holla at you.